Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're all right. Um, since I spoke to you last, I had my brief um, half-term break um, in three wards of George Eliot Hospital, uh, from which I was released yesterday. <laughs> and uh, it seems so strange being on the other side of the fence, if you will, considering I do the on-call chaplaincy actually today for the hospital each week. And I've also visited parishioners there on countless occasions over the years, but the shoe was definitely on the other foot. Um, and in many ways, I'm grateful for that experience. When you are a patient, you see things entirely in an entirely different way from being a chaplain or a visitor. You're no longer the professional in control of what you do, when you do it, but vulnerable, feeble and even frail, dependent on the goodness and professionalism of others. It's a salutary, but also a very helpful experience. First of all, now, you see the sheer scale of the challenge that has overtaken our hospitals and their staff, particularly in the last 18 months, or as a result of it, they are literally worked off the feet. And yet they seem to keep their kindness and goodness even when they're being pestered, which is a remarkable achievement. Um, and funnily enough, having written this piece for the Hinkley Times last week called Terms of Endearment, which I believe was also published in the Leicester Mercury, um, on how we're being discouraged from speaking warmly to people by calling them, you know, uh, dear or darling or duck, um, it was very reassuring to be called darling or lovely by many of the staff in the hospital. So thank God for them all. We're so lucky to have them and let's be sure to keep praying for them. Last week we were speaking about some aspects of sin and how they affect us. We said that sin is not just individual acts, but a long-term condition that is alive and well in each of us. No one is immune from its influence. This weekend, sadly, we saw this at its most graphic in the murder of Sir David Amos, a loyal and devoted constituency MP in Leon C. This has happened before, not just to parliamentarians, but also to countless others, particularly the young. And what is it we find ourselves asking? Uh, what is it that comes over a person to make them do such a thing in, in such a cold-blooded and calculated manner? To an extent, we can always understand what we call crimes of passion, where in the heat of a moment, uh, a person is so provoked that they commit a heinous act. That doesn't excuse their behaviour, but it does sometimes explain it. A good man like Sir David, who spent nearly 40 years on the back benches supporting his people, no matter what their political persuasion, could never have deserved a fate like this. I remember distinctly 47 years ago now, the night of the Birmingham bombs, where I was at the time, and how two, two of the three underground pubs in the city were deliberately targeted for bombs to cause the most damage, murder and mayhem. And I'd actually been in one of those pubs myself only the evening before with some friends, um, and then on the weekend afterwards I was preaching in the parish in which most of those who came to be called the Birmingham Six lived. They were arrested, charged and put in jail for 18 years and then found to be entirely innocent. But this was cold-blooded murder, sheer evil, planned. And not only those killed and injured along with their families suffered, but the whole Irish community in the city as well, if not in other parts of the country. Irish production workers on the line at British Leyland were immediately vilified and even attacked by those who'd been their friends and colleagues only the day before. Our seminary was instantly classified as the bomb factory and all sorts of vicious recrimination was meted out to Irish people everywhere. The ramifications of these two bombings spread far and wide as indeed those of the other occasions that this terrorist behavior visited our islands. I well remember that night a kindly Irish parish priest in Saltley who had to go to a family in his parish to tell them that their two sons had been killed in the bombing. One boy was in university in Canterbury and the other in Durham. They had agreed to come home for the weekend to surprise their mother for her birthday and to meet up in the tavern in the town pub. 
They were both murdered and their parents completely unaware of what had happened to them until the priest arrived at their door. Hence the ramifications of one great sin spread far and wide, enveloping others imperceptibly into its wickedness by creating anger, resentment and a strong desire for revenge. But can that desire ever be satisfied? Does it not build and build on itself until it gets out of hand and overtakes us? Think about the Hillsborough episode or the Grenfell fire or the Black Lives Matter movement or anything similar that makes us want to bay out for justice. And what does justice mean anyway? Does it mean compensation, revenge, recrimination? How can it be satisfied if at all? This has particular relevance to the very painful matter of which I spoke to you last week, namely the abuse of innocent children by priests or religious. How can there be justice for them? What sort of realistic compensation could there be somehow to help them get over this dreadful experience? How can we ever recover from the anger that might have made us never want to set foot in a church again? I know I've told you this before, but it does bear repeating. There was an article by Brendan O'Connor, the journalist in the Irish Independent three or four years ago, in which he said, outrage is the crack cocaine of 21st century emotions. In other words, there is something in this desire for so-called revenge that overtakes you like a drug to such an extent that even if you get what you are outraged about and demand, you will still want more, still be outraged. I often think of this when I hear of people continually making complaints to schools, through social media, to the health service, and yes, to the church as well. On Sunday evening, I had a long conversation with a nursing sister in the hospital about what it was like nursing COVID-19 patients and the sheer horror of it all. When they'd been through this experience from which it might take them years to recover, and then heard the pettiness of people complaining about nothing of any real consequence, it made them feel just sad and truly disappointed. What happens when we have an overwhelming desire to complain that does not leave us is precisely what happens is when we're overtaken by sin. We're somehow trapped and we can't find a way out of it. We've seen this already in the mention of Shakespeare's tragedies, how sins destroys people, and in St. Paul and St. James, however, overtakes us in a destructive manner. Think of being angry, for example. How does this arise? What makes you angry? Where does it come from? How does it cloud our vision so that we can see nothing else? How can something seemingly insignificant spark off a torrent of rage in us? The same applies with resentment, with lust, jealousy, envy as well. We find ourselves being consumed and don't know how to get out of it. We are, if you like, almost enslaved by it and its expressions in words or deeds. And this can be a dreadful experience. So what then? If we are so imprisoned or locked up within ourselves and these emotions, what does it mean? It means that we're looking for an escape, for a way out. We're looking to be saved from this diminishing and destructive experience. We're looking to be redeemed. The word redemption is often used in the context of slavery. And here it refers to the slavery of sin, which drags us down into our own interior prison. Hence, it is no surprise that we sometimes refer to our Lord as our savior or our redeemer, because that is precisely who he is. It is Jesus who has freed us from the destructive effects of sin through being destroyed himself. His passion and cross is dying in which he took upon himself the destructive results of sin, literally death, is the means of our redemption. We talk about him taking away our sin and taking away the sin of the world, about his healing of our wounds, not of the physical but the spiritual side, because sin wounds us and others as well. This is far away from the notion of Christianity as just being nice or polite and kind and is far deeper and much more dynamic. It is about the redemption of humanity and the restoration of life. 
The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Roman, Rowan Williams, wrote in a recent book, the drama at the core of our humanity is about our reluctance to be human, and the gift that the church offers is the resource and the courage to step into Jesus' world and begin the business of being human afresh, again and again, because our reluctance keeps us coming back. But if we do take such a step, the look of the country changes. Strangers are less threatening. It becomes possible to live more with our own failure and humiliation. And we may even be able to have a faint idea of what it means to claim that human life is created for joyful sharing in God's life. And more, we become ambassadors for this new world, seeking wherever we are to let men and women know that violence and death do not have the last word where humanity is concerned. The means of such redemption taking place is the personal and inhuman human encounter, as Bishop Patrick calls it, with our Lord. At the moment, in Span, we are working on the very project which this enterprise has for its title, I Have for My Mission, and will do so frequently during the confirmation program, which will be commencing in a few weeks. We've spoken about all sorts of encounters or personal meetings between people and the effect it had on them. Some of this, of course, was a bit silly. Who have you met? Who would you like to meet? And so on. But it leads us to a reflection of what meetings between people can do, especially those that are unexpected or maybe unthought of. We spoke of Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat, of Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, the so-called Chuckle Brothers, and of the wonderful meeting between German and British soldiers in the trenches of Belgium on the first Christmas of World War in 1914 which we turned into a play for its centenary. The key to our understanding all of this was that in these encounters, people were changed, how they see things, sometimes irrevocably, to the extent that something unimagined emerged and happened. To hear the letters home from the front during that Christmas truce is so encouraging and almost incredible. Dear Mother, you will never believe what I am doing. I am smoking a German cigar. And the man who gave it to me is standing right next to me. I was trying to kill him half an hour ago, and now he is my friend. There are so many other examples of this sort of thing happening in history, and so many different places, but also in our own personal lives as well. However, in order for such a life-changing encounter to take place, the participants must be what we call properly disposed, that is, willing for this to happen. Which brings us back to the poem of D.H. Lawrence, which we quoted all those weeks ago last spring. Are you willing to be erased, sponged out, to be dipped into oblivion, made into nothing? If not, you will never really change. And when we look at some of the encounters in the Bible, this is the sort of thing we often see. A realisation of who I am in the face of such goodness and grace, fear, or a sense of our own nothingness and unworthiness are frequent emotions that appear in the pages of the great book, especially in the relationships our Lord has with others. There were, of course, those of pharisaical mind who were outraged at him, what he said and what he did, particularly where their own tradition and faith were concerned. It was they who would ultimately seek to do away with him, not because they disagreed with him, but because he had shown them up as hypocrites who were not close to God at all. And also there were those, like his disciples, who were radically changed in the opposite way, in an almost instant, to become his followers and thereafter his missionaries. It was as if whatever was sinful in them disappeared instantly and they were transformed. This is the power of grace, God's complete self-giving love at work in them. This is where forgiveness and atonement, making up for hurt caused, arise and flourish. This is the life offered to us in discipleship with our Lord. But for this to happen, we too must be similarly well disposed, ready to receive this gift and willing to enter into this life-changing encounter with our Lord, which happens chiefly through prayer, our own personal encounter with him. So then, what does it mean to be saved or redeemed? 
we use the expression in so many different ways. We talk of saving something for a purpose. For example, money, a pension, a keepsake that is treasured by us and we do not want to lose it. Or if you're something of a paper hoarder like me, articles from the newspapers, past homilies or scripts, which might be useful to refer to at a future date. God help anyone who has to clear out my mess when I'm gone. And then we talk of saving from some catastrophe or danger or disaster, like drowning or some form of accident. Or maybe something somewhat frivolous, like save, save from being, making a fool of yourself. At the moment, there is a lot of talk about saving the planet, especially with the forthcoming G COP, what's called COP26, summit in Glasgow. This is entirely right and disastrously overdue. We cannot wait a minute longer, though there are many who cannot see or prefer to deny vehemently the emergency we are in. Our behaviour, so often selfish, unthinking and, yes, sinful, has systematically damaged our planet and is slowly destroying it. We've now seen this graphically in the unexplained rises and falls in temperature, the melting of the ice cap, floods, storms, fires all over the world, but we still close our eyes to it and carry on regardless. Such behaviour is at best unthinking and irresponsible, and we have to ask ourselves what sort of world we want for our children and grandchildren to grow up in, and how can we ensure that there will be a world at all? How can we save our earth, God's earth, from destruction? There is no doubt that much of our problem is caused by human beings, directly or indirectly, and we've said this repeatedly these last few weeks, and that therefore much of the salvation will come from human beings as well. Finally, in the Christian sense, salvation is often thought of as a once-for-all event which happens to us through some sort of encounter with our Lord, maybe even in dramatic circumstances. We are saved. The implications of this statement are that once this has happened, we can never sin again and not be saved, and that we're surely destined for a life with the Lord in heaven, whatever we perceive that to be. Now we are saved through Jesus, it is our task to save others as well, and this is the purpose of our Christian life. Such a situation, we should say, does not always sit easily with the Catholic mind, formed as it was so often by guilt and the possibility of repeated sin. It seems to us as human beings that there is always the possibility of reneging on the deal, even if we have been saved through baptism and the profession of faith in Jesus. We are practical people, and we know what we are like and what we can be like. The once-for-all event, thus, seems a little out of kilter to us because we know ourselves. Furthermore, the thought that salvation can be earned is also somewhat troublesome. Look, for example, at the number of times the word merit or profit is used in the new translation of our missal, which is clumsy and often unprayable. What does it mean? What is it trying to say? So is salvation from sin given freely with no strings attached? Or is it something that we have to earn by good deeds and worthy living? This is what we will consider next time.